Hey guys, Woodruff here. Um, so now let's talk about parenteral nutrition. So the last video talked about enteral nutrition, which is food um, that we give through a tube straight into the GI system. So I think enteral, it's entering into my, um, uh, what do you call it, GI system. So this is for someone who can be fed through their GI system. Um, there's also what's known as parenteral nutrition. Um, and so um, maybe if enteral nutrition is not up to par, that's when you need parenteral nutrition. <laughs> All right, I'm going to stop. Um, so um, what do you call um Think parenteral, think this is outside of the GI system nutrition. And so if we're giving nutrients outside of the GI system, how are we giving it? We are giving this through um, IV. So it's intravenous nutrition is a way that you could look at um, parenteral nutrition. Um <clears throat> this is great for people that maybe have gastrointestinal disorders, some sort of malnutrition, malabsorption. So like when we talked about malnutrition patients with Crohn's, like there's no amount of like when someone has inflamed bowels, there's no amount of giving them so much um, um, tube feeds to the point where they finally can absorb it if they have a malabsorption issue, especially if they have inflamed bowels, it's usually a time we want to let their bowels rest. There's also people that get obstructions. There's going to be a lot of just GI disorders that we talk about that this will make more sense, but it's people that can't ingest, ingest, digest, or absorb their nutrients through the regular old way through the GI tract. Um, the cool thing about TPN, <clears throat> well, I'll say TPN, the th cool thing about parenteral nutrition is for some types like TPN, we can actually customize it to the needs of the patient. So what the pharmacy will do is they'll actually look at the patient's labs and um, stuff like that and look at the patient's um, history, other needs, um, how they're doing, what their blood sugar is, um, you know, what deficits they might have and needs they might have, look at their electrolytes stuff like that and see exactly what they need and make a custom bag for each patient, um, which really helps to make more like individualized nutrition that we can't really do with um, tube feeding. Um, just like with tube feeding, we do use sugar for calories um, for a lot of this. So this is a high sugar content direct into the IV. Um, the other nutrients that they have, there's calories, protein, electrolytes. We also give them elements and vitamins. Let's try again. Come on. All right. There you go. So let's, before we get too deep into um, <clears throat> parenteral nutrition issues, um, let's talk about possible complications of T it says TPN, but let's think that could be for any parenteral nutrition because I think some of these say PPN. So for each of the following findings, which are indicative that the client is experiencing a complication from their parenteral nutrition. Um, so what that's really telling me when I read that, when I'm, um, if you had a question like this on an exam, what you would want to think about is, is, is that it would have to be a direct complication from their parenteral nutrition. Um, not necessarily like some of these might be complications, but not necessarily a complication of TPN. So for an answer to be correct here, it has to meet two criteria. One, it has to be a complication and two, it specifically has to be a complication directly related to parenteral nutrition. Um, so the first one says client is receiving TPN and has a temperature of 101.7. So the client's receiving parenteral nutrition. So they are at risk for complication. And then it's pretty much saying is a fever, a complication of parenteral nutrition. Um, so a fever is because um, we haven't talked about this yet, but parenteral nutrition is given via IV lines. And we have to put them usually in a larger IV line, like a um, pick line, a central line. And as a result, they can get infections from those lines. So it's not necessarily the food itself that they're getting an infection from, but it is kind of, because what did I say that there's a lot of in these um, bags of nutrition? There is a lot of Yes, if you're saying, oh, I'm sorry, that was a really slow response. My brain like literally had like a brain fart. So yes, sorry that if you're thinking um, sugar, you have the right answer. Maybe I need sugar for my brain. Maybe that's the issue here. <laughs> so yes, but um, yeah, so, um, you know, there's a lot of sugar in these um, bags of nutrition and what does sugar attract? If you don't know, sugar attracts bacteria. So since sugar attracts bacteria, they're going to be high risk for infection already. But then just the presence of having the lines we need to feed these patients also increases their risk. So the second one, client is receiving T. So that is a yes. Um, it's not a good thing. It's yes. Oh, so maybe I should make sadder faces. Yes. 
central line infection. All right. So um, the client is receiving TPN and they have gained two pounds in the last week. So first, client's receiving TPN. So it's possible that they have a complication from their TPN. Uh, they gained two pounds in the last week. So um, another complication we're going to talk about is they can have fluid overload issues. But two pounds in the last week, that's actually probably good. And we have to think about what am I hoping a patient's going to do when they're on TPN? Well, I'm hoping they're going to be well nourished. And a good sign of nourishment is gaining weight. Um, and so this is actually a good thing. So this would be not an indicative of a complication because it's actually a good thing. This is what I'm hoping. If this question said, how do I know the client is, um, you know, experiencing the expected effects of the parenteral nutrition, this would be yes. But this is a no because gaining two pounds in the last week is good. It means they're gaining weight. And um, uh, we caught them. It's unlikely that that's a sign of a complication um, like fluid overload because it's not very much in a period of time. So that's a good thing. Um, client is receiving TPN and has a blood glucose of 275. So hmm, this is a complication. They're receiving TPN and their blood glucose is high. So again, that that is a problem. All of these could be problems potentially. It's either, again, the, the, the wrong answers here are either going to be wrong because they're not a complication or they're going to be wrong because they're not a complication specifically of parenteral nutrition. Um, but then we have to think about, okay, so TPN, could TPN raise my blood glucose? Well, what do we just say that there's a lot of in TPN? There's a lot of sugar. I guess my brain's coming back now. Um, and so um, with there being a lot of sugar in the TPN, um, that's going to put that patient at risk for um, having hyperglycemia. And we talked about it a little bit with enteral nutrition, but it's even more pronounced usually with TPN patients and their blood sugar can go super high because we were literally inserting sugar straight into their bloodstream. Um, so yeah, so they usually, uh, a lot of these patients are going to actually have insulin in their bags um, to counteract the uh, effects of the sugar. Um, and I'm talking about insulin in their bags of TPN, like they'll have the sugar and then also insulin. All right. So that is also a yes complication, but sad. Yeah. Hyperglycemia. Um, receiving PPN and their urine output is 75 mils per hour. So PPN is peripheral parenteral nutrition. So total TPN is total parenteral nutrition. Um, and it has to be given through a central line where PPN is, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, like I said, peripheral parenteral nutrition. It can be given through a peripheral IV. Um, we'll talk about that here in a minute about that difference there. Um, and it says um, their urine output is 75 mils per hour. So the receiving parental nutrition, then we have to say, is urine output being 75 an hour a bad thing? Is this a complication? And it actually is not a complication. So just like with the second one, this is okay. This is actually a sign of hydration. It's good. Um, it's a sign that they're getting fluid out of their body, which is good. There's nothing else in this statement that tells me there's a problem here. So this is going to also be a no. Uh, client is receiving PPN is there, there's redness and irritation at their IV site. Hmm. So um, another, like this one, this patient, they're getting a nutrition through a peripheral IV. Now you may say, hey, there's a less chance of there being a problem. At least there's no chance for infection. Um, but we're putting a lot of very thick um, sometimes viscous kind of nutrients in a very small vessel. So they're actually very high risk for phlebitis, infiltration, things like that. So this is another possible complication. We need to be watching our IV site very closely with these patients. So then the last one, client is receiving TPN and has developed wheezes. Hmm. So, um, we, and, uh, what do you call it? Um, you know, in, it's really easy to look in deeply and you could probably turn in, uh, turn a lot of these into something more directly related to TPM. But when you're thinking about this, we talked about another, one possible complication is fluid overload. So when I see lung sounds, I'm like, hmm, what would their lungs sound like if there was a problem? So we have to go back and remember what is the difference between coarse crackles and wheezes. So the uh, main types of lung sounds, you either have what lung sounds or you have narrow or constricted airway lung sounds. So I have to think, if someone has constricted airway lung sounds, like that's not really usually related to receiving 
um, you know, some sort of nutrition through your body. Usually you develop wheezes if you have things like asthma, COPD, um, but it's not going to be because you have too much fluid. So a lot of people would answer yes to this because they just kind of remember, hey, there's something with TPN in the lungs, but it has to be the right lung sound. And it would be, um, a, what do you call it? Um, it's TPN and development of wheezes are not a common or connected complication. If this said client is receiving TPN and has developed audible coarse crackles, it would be a complication but um, since it says develop wheezes, it is not. So the complications here are the temperature of 101, showing sign of infection, most likely a central line infection, um, the blood sugar 275, hyperglycemia being a complication, and then um, IV complication with redness and irritation at the site. Let me go back up real quick. All right, I just want to make sure. I thought I had, okay, yes, maybe I moved it here. I moved some stuff around a little bit. So how can I make sure that um, per, uh, parenteral nutrition is safely administered? Um, so the pharmacy prepares these, like, especially if we're talking about TPN, the total parenteral nutrition that's individualized to the patient. So they prepare it and send it up. And usually most hospitals I've worked at, they give it, um, it's given, like we change it out, uh, every 24 hours. And, um, a lot of times, at least the hospitals I've worked at, it changes out on night shift, usually around 9 PM at night. And so when, uh, when it's time to switch it out, I go and I grab the bag. It needs to stay refrigerated for at least 30 minutes up until use usually, um, depending every hospital facility, everything's a little bit different, but you know, usually they don't deliver it until right before. And then I'm going to hang the bag. I do not want to hang it late because again, those bags are just kind of like with the tube feeds. We like to change them every 24 hours. Um, we want to change these bags too. Um, and then I'm not going to put anything in this bag. I'm usually not even, unless they're also getting like lit lipids or a fat emulsion with it. I'm not going to Y site or do anything. You may sit there and be like, oh yeah, I can, I need, I only have one IV line. I need to, you know, have other stuff. This is not IV fluid. There's a lot of chemicals, other stuff in this that could mix and cause problems. So we do not mix things, add things or do anything else. Pharmacy manages, whatever's in that bag, that's what you're given. You're not mixing anything, adding anything, changing anything. Um, we need to have appropriate IV access. So as the nurse, I need to assessing IV access is a, definitely a priority assessment. Like I said, the TPN or total parenteral nutrition is given via a central line or a pick line. Um, and then a PPN peripheral parenteral nutrition can be given with a peripheral IV, or we can use a central line or pick line as well, just depending on, um, patient preference, usually uh, not patient, yeah, sorry, doctor preference. Um, so TPN is usually given for people that have like need more long-term, um, or have very severe like malnutrition, whereas PPN is usually like a short-term bridge. Like maybe someone can't eat for a day or two, um, we'll put that, but they really need the nutrition. We'll, um, sometimes put them on the PPN. Um, but yeah, both of them have very thick particles. So that's why you need the right kind of IV. Um, so like give, giving it a central line, it kind of automatically starts to dilute it because it's going in such a big blood vessel. Whereas if we gave TPN through a small blood vessel, um, it would clog off like almost immediately. It could be very dangerous for the patient. We also have to give it through a filter because even though we're giving it in a large vessel, we still need to make the particles smaller. So um, we use what we call like a micron filter and um, we have to make, you always want to make sure that it is connected correctly to the patient with that filter. Um, uh, this is a two nurse sign off, which means when I give this medication, I call another nurse in there and we literally like, kind of like checking off blood. Like we read down, this is a very high risk med. We read down every single ingredient, nutrient, what percentage, how much is going to be in that bag. And like I mentioned, um, we change them every 24 hours, the tubing as well. Um, and then also keep in mind, we don't want to draw blood from this port. So if they're, we're giving it central line, pick line, um, and let's say they have morning labs to draw, we usually draw from their pick line or central line. We will not do this. You know, what's going to happen? Their blood sugar is going to say it's over a thousand. Like I've had, I've seen it happen to other people, um, where like I come in, I'm like, what's up with these labs? And they're like, oh, I drew from the wrong port. And I mean, sometimes like you can even flush it and think it's really good, but trust me, like I always try to, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, if, if I, if I have no other options and they're like a really hard stick. Um, you have to like pause it, flush it like crazy. Um, and you still can't even guarantee that those labs are accurate. Cause you have to think about it. You're giving a whole bunch of nutrients, electrolytes, other things into that IV. And then to draw, um, blood, like right around where you're administering all this stuff, it's not going to be very accurate results. So usually we want them to, um, you know, we try to, uh, you know, draw from somewhere else, um, if we can, because we really want to get accurate labs with these patients too, because there can be complications. 
So what kind of complications can there be? So one thing to consider is, is that the, a lot of these patients, they're severely malnourished that are getting parenteral nutrition. So there is the risk for what's called refeeding syndrome. And um, this is what, and I, you don't like, this is like a, like a little diagram of how it happens. You do not need to know this patho or get in depth. I have this because it helps me remember what um, deficiencies they have. But effectively what happens is the body just gets overwhelmed. It's used to doing one type of metabolism. And all of a sudden it's like, hey, wait, nutrients are here. And so like the body just gets overwhelmed and it's like, okay, this is too much. I can't do this. And so they end up having the, all these like issues with the cell that leads to electrolyte imbalances. So really you want to think about their phosphorus is going to be low. Their blood glucose is going to be high. Um, their potassium is going to be low and their magnesium is going to be low. So everything is low except their blood sugar. Um, and of course, this is a problem because we have that low potassium, that low magnesium. It can lead to dysrhythmias and death. Um, so it can lead to some very serious issues. Um, magnesium also deals sometimes with airway stuff too. So we are worried about like respiratory arrest. Uh, other, um, so we want to monitor for that and um, look for those imbalances, which is why we really need to get accurate labs to make sure that we are treating them appropriately. Because if I drew straight from that line, it might show that their electrolytes are actually high and um, it could definitely lead to some uh, inaccurate treatment or some serious problems. Um, hyper or hypoglycemia, we like to check their blood glucose every four to six hours. You know, you, the, bu the book that um, we're using, the most recent one said that we like the blood glucose 140 to 180 in a dream world. Um, it just, it's really hard to get sometimes, but it's, it's all about finding the balance. So sometimes every day the pharmacist has to kind of go in and you know, may add some more insulin or try to um, decrease the amount of sugar that we have in it. Or sometimes we have to check their blood glucose more frequently or, you know, increase doses or do long acting insulin, other things. But um, we want to keep their blood sugar, um, you know, in a manageable range. Cause remember the higher the sugar, higher chance of complications. They're not going to heal right. They're going to be more prone to infections, et cetera. Um, then for, um, we're also for low blood sugar. What we're worried about that is, is, is they're not usually at risk for low blood sugar, like just hanging out, taking on their TPN. But if I stop it, so if I was like, Hey, I'm going to stop their TPN for a little bit, like an hour before I draw their labs, um, they're actually really high risk and don't do that by the way. Um, but they're really high risk for, um, having hypoglycemia, their body's getting a constant infusion of sugar. And if you take that away suddenly, um, the body just doesn't know how to react and you can have like a massive hypoglycemia. And so, um, a little rhyme here, unintentional give D10. If you stop TPN, so we usually give D10, we put them on a D10 drip. It'll actually usually be a part of your order set for this medication um, that you automatically have it. Like you don't have to call the doctor and ask for it. Um, but uh, what do you call it? Uh, when I say that, if a test question said, call the doctor and get an order for D10, that's probably the right answer. So we're not trying to trick you with that, but just know like normally most hospitals have this set up as a part of your order set. Kind of like if I have anyone who's on insulin, they have orders for like dextrose and stuff in case of hypoglycemia. Um, and we always taper it slowly. So like if some, if we're going to take someone off TPN, I'm not just like, oh, they're better now, turn it off. We slowly taper it. So if they're go getting it at 75 an hour, then I'm going to go down to 65, 55, 45, et cetera, and slowly uh, wean it off um, to get their body like readjusted to having less sugar. Because again, the body just doesn't do well with like sudden changes like that. Um, monitor for other organ dysfunction. So a lot of these particles and things like that, if there's a lot of fat in it, um, it can affect, uh, it can affect your filters, especially your liver, um, with your liver, we need to get regular liver function testing. And sometimes like if it's stable, we'll check it weekly, but we might have to check it more, we, uh, more often if there's bigger issues going on. Um, the liver is in charge of cholesterol and sometimes, um, can get very overwhelmed, by the nutrients that are in um, TPN and things like that. So, but also check the kidneys out because the kidneys are very flow dependent and we can get very fluid overloaded or um, especially in certain patients, if their heart's not working well, they can just get um, overwhelmed um, with all of the extra fluid and sugar and et cetera can irritate the blood vessels. Um, like I mentioned, the high cholesterol can be an issue with these patients because there's a lot of fat content or sometimes they're getting TPN, but also what's called a fat emulsion. It literally is like a bag of white stuff, bag of fat. Um, it's like, think of it as like a big thing, juicy thing of milk. Um, and it's just giving you a ton of fat to um, help with your nutrition. So we want to watch their, uh, their cholesterol levels, things like that. 
Um, we're also concerned about fluid overload. So some of my uh, best measures to tell uh, how a patient's doing is going to be um, listening to their lungs. So I would say lungs and legs. And usually the first place that we're going to have fluid go if we're fluid overload is our lungs. Then after that, we'll check the legs. And, and uh, again, like that's just my experience that usually the lungs are the first place. And I think it's actually too like a um, a actual um, like research or scientific thing that the because of the how permeable the capillaries are in the lungs they're more likely to have fluid overload but anyway um, leg uh, lungs legs I'm checking my eyes and o's and if there's like a severe imbalance between what's going in and what's coming out um, and a daily weight can also tell like if there's a sharp increase in weight we're going to be concerned um, and then like I mentioned we need to watch our IV closely look for infection also look for phlebitis infiltration issues with that IV um, to make sure that they're not having um, serious issues. The big issue is blood glucose, monitor your electrolytes, watch your um, organ function, look for too much fluid, and watch for line complications. So how do we know that enteral parenteral nutrition has been effective? So we talked about this a little bit earlier, but effectively, we're going to effectively, we're going to know it's effective. If um, a lot of it's going to be about that weight, seeing that they're increasing in weight, that's what I'm hoping for. Like this is nutrition. So I'm hoping they're going to have signs of increased nutrition. So I'll also look back to that physical assessment. You know, we may see improvements in their skin and their healing, um, less weak, things like that. Mental status may be improving, mood improving, that kind of stuff too can help uh, or be assigned short term. Um, we're going to check some labs and um, do some other measures to kind of check to see where their weight, their health is, their electrolytes, organ function, all that stuff. But um, on a basic level, it's going to be a lot of that uh, assessment, think the neurological assessment, um, skin and um, skin, hair, nails, um, their muscle strength. Those are going to be a lot of those um, first assessments that you're going to see. And then also the fact that maybe like, you know, maybe they like, especially if they have wounds or burns or something, maybe they're healing better finally or starting to heal when they weren't before. All right. That's it for that. On to obesity next. See you there.